coming up on The Cost of Living. You know, the cost of a plumber, the cost of a carpenter, the cost of a, of, of a handy person, you know, anybody, glazing, you name it, Paul. The reality is, is it's gone up almost 40% in three years because there's not enough of them. More skilled trades workers are retiring every day. Canada's been heading towards this demographic cliff for a while. Amanda well, Renahan says she knows how to beat this problem. And part of the answer is more people like her. Hi, I'm Paul Haverschrud. Welcome to The Cost of Living. Now, stop me if you've heard this one before, but the boomers are retiring. And Canada needs to build a lot of stuff right now. So, who's gonna do it? Well, women make up half the population, but less than 10% of skilled trades workers. Mandy Renahan says the math is simple, and the money is good. Also today, getting on a plane isn't always a vacation. You line up at security, you line up at departures. Then there's the tyranny of the overhead bin, the fight to find space for your bag. So what if airlines could make flying better by, wait for it, charging for carry-on? Up first, the federal budget comes out next week. And something that could be on the agenda? How pension plans invest your money. All right, Jen Keen, pop quiz time. Do you know what's had a good run for the last 20 years? Uh, the last 20 years? Like, uh, I don't know, Beyonce? Yes, absolutely. You're <laughs> right. <laughs> but not just Bay, also your very own Canada pension plan. In the last 20 years, it's gone from around 70 billion to nearly 600 billion. That is pretty good. But I can top that. If you look at all of Canada's public pensions, they have around $3 trillion in assets. Which is huge. Like if you take all the companies in the Toronto Stock Exchange, add up their value, it's you know just a little bit more than $3 trillion. Let's just call it a big pile of money. And some people in Canada have their eye on it right now. A bunch of corporate executives signed an open letter recently saying that pension plans should really think about investing more in Canadian public companies. And some big names signed this letter, the CEOs of Rogers, Telus, Synovus. It was published in March, weeks before the federal budget came out, so the timing is maybe not a coincidence because Ottawa did suggest in the fall economic statement that there could be changes to pension rules coming. And this is making people in the pension world nervous. Here's why. If we look back to the 90s, which, all things considered, really wasn't that long ago, pensions were in bad shape. Bad as in, might run out of money. Now, back then, the rules said they had to invest mostly in Canada. Like, 90% of their assets had to go into stuff here. And this just wasn't working. So the finance minister at the time, Paul Martin, he blew up the rules. And this was a huge change. Jim Stanford, he's a labor economist who signed that open letter. He says the, the changes that came in the 90s were like a turning point for Canada's pension plans. The funds went from being heavily regulated to being told, like, fly and be free and invest wherever you want. And in that regard, they just started thinking, where, where in the world can I get the biggest return for my fund and for the members of the fund? Um, so we have definitely seen uh, a shift in the asset allocation of pension funds so that uh, a larger share of the money is located uh, internationally instead of in Canada. If you look at the CPP, it now invests more than twice as much in the United States than it does in Canada. And this kind of investing freedom has turned things around. Like some funds now have so much money that people are asking, could we use some of that cash to help the country? Well, not only could we, but should we? Like, philosophically, it's Canadian money. Why not invest some of it to help the economy? And if you ask Jim Stanford that question, he would say, yes, we should. Now, he's not saying let's go back to the 90s, but the letter, he says, is it's asking for a bit more pension money to stay in the country. 
you know, this isn't a return to Soviet-style central planning or anything like that. Far from it. This is just uh, indicating Canada's got an investment problem, but we've got trillions of dollars of publicly subsidized pension capital. Uh, isn't there a way we can put those two things together? And I think that as a general goal is uh, absolutely legitimate. When he says investment problem, he's talking about Canadian companies not investing enough in stuff that could help them today, but also the economy in the future. So new technology, new machinery, innovation. And because this kind of investment isn't happening, Canada's economic productivity is getting worse. Businesses' investment effort in Canada has declined a lot uh, over the last couple of decades. And this is probably the most important single reason why Canada's productivity performance has slowed down. If you don't have the latest technology and machinery and tools to do your work with, then uh, you're not going to produce as much in an hour of work. And that's exactly what the productivity data is showing. So this idea that pension plans can help an economy, it's not just a Canadian debate. It's actually happening in a lot of countries, and it's often wrapped up in a sense of patriotism. And even economic nationalism. Like here in Canada, it's why don't we make Canadian money work for Canada? If pension funds, which are the biggest single pools of capital going were either encouraged or even pushed a bit to uh, invest uh, more of their funds in Canadian businesses, which in turn invested them here in Canada, then that would help to solve this underinvestment issue that we're facing. So that's the argument for changing the pension rules, but the stakes are high here. I mean, we're talking about people's retirements. And our pensions are doing really well. Largely, Jim Leach says, because they've been left alone. Every single one of those plans, once they were spun out of government, freed from these government restrictions, were able to increase um, their investment returns. Jim Leach is the former head of the Ontario Teachers Pension Plan, which is one of the country's biggest pension funds. And he is not a fan of this argument that we should invest more in Canadian public companies. He's really more of a bottom line guy. The mathematics of a pension plan are that approximately 20% of the pension you would receive as a retiree comes from the contributions that you and your employer made. 80% comes from the investment returns on those contributions. So pensions need to make solid returns to keep money flowing to pensioners. And they are. I mean, CPP has made nearly 10% a year for the last decade. It's been called the gold standard of public pension plans. And it has just one mandate, to maximize returns. Now, other pension plans have what's called a dual mandate, like the KESS in Quebec. If you look at the KESS, it has two jobs. One, generate returns for pensioners, but also contribute to the province's economic development. So that's a different model, and no one is really talking openly about a dual mandate for the CPP. If you actually read the fall economic statement, it says, maybe we can encourage more Canadian investment or raise the cap on pension ownership of public firms. So at this point, it's kind of like tweaks, you know, some pretty modest stuff. Yeah, but Jim Leach thinks that if you start changing the rules, you risk messing with a good thing. He says, just just look at the importance of diversification. Like, pension plans don't want to put all their eggs in one basket. And when you look at the TSX, most of the eggs are in just one or two baskets. In Canada, most, if you, if you take a look at our stock exchanges, we have a heavy bias towards resources and financial institutions. The banks and the resource companies dominate, okay? We don't have a big tech sector. We don't have a big consumer product sector. So if you want exposure to resources and, and banks, Canadian banks only, yeah, uh, that's what you're gonna get when you go on the Toronto Stock Exchange. He's just not convinced that putting more pension money into banks and oil companies would do that much for the economy. And if you think about how this plan would work, the idea goes like this. Pension plans investing more in publicly traded companies would make it easier for those companies to sell shares and raise money in the stock market. Then they could, theoretically, take that money 
and spend it on all sorts of good stuff that would then help the economy. And that is theoretical at this point because there's no guarantee that that would happen. A company could choose to take that money and pay down its debt or raise its dividend for shareholders. And hey, not to doubt the sincerity of any of the CEOs who signed the letter, but a publicly traded company coming after pension cash is a bit like the fox trying to get into the henhouse. Now, Jim Leach does agree with Jim Stanford on one thing, and that is that the Canadian economy right now does have problems, and investment is one of them. But he thinks that the fix, it's going to take more work. It's really about making Canada a better place to invest. He thinks you should leave pension plans out of it. Our objective is to secure the financial future of Canadians so that when they retire, they have they are not a burden on society. They have their own savings that has been accumulated and they've earned money on that can give them a very healthy uh, and fruitful retirement. They'll buy goods and services. They pay tax. They, they do all the things that uh, somebody who's not destitute does. Destitute does sound bad, doesn't it? Like Charles Dickens kind of bad. <laughs> so you know, if pensions are helping people, you know, not be Oliver Twist, please, sir, may I have some more? Is that enough? Or should they do more? We're talking about trillions of dollars. How it should be invested is becoming more of a question. And uh, the federal budget is coming out pretty soon, April 16th. That is next week. So we may not have to wait long to get some answers. On your Radio and by podcast, this is The Cost of Living. I'm Paul Haverschrude. Getting on a plane isn't always the height of relaxation. You rush to the airport, then wait in a long line at security. You stand in another line to get on the plane. Then finding a spot in the overhead bin is like a high-stakes game of cutthroat musical chairs. In a story that first aired earlier this season, our producer Daniel Nerman asked if anything could make flying the friendly skies just a bit friendlier. And she found, yeah, if airlines made one simple change. Kat Jones spent a decade working as a WestJet flight attendant and says you wouldn't believe the people brought on board. House plants, body pillows, Flights coming back from Disneyland were especially challenging. Where am I going to put these lightsabers and massive stuffed animals and Mickey Mouses, you know, coming in on top of the allotted one carry-on, one personal item? Then there was the time someone boarded the plane with a wedding cake. Oh my gosh, here we go. And I'm already looking down the aisle to see, okay, what are, what's the bin situation like? That cake wasn't going in a bin. It needed its own seat. Passengers had to move around, and the flight was delayed by 10 minutes. And that kind of thing can just really screw up the entire day. When flight crews have to play Tetris with carry-on, that can delay the next flight and the one after that. This is a real problem for airlines. Henry Hardevelt is a travel analyst with Atmosphere Research Group. When the airplane is sitting on the ground, it's not making money for the airline. Guests seated in zone three are now welcome to board. Airlines are always trying to streamline the boarding process. That's why United just brought in something called Wilma. Passengers in the window seat board first, then the middle, and last, people in the aisle. We are now boarding all guests in all zones. But if everyone is still looking for space to cram in their carry-on, Hardevelt says there will be delays. If you go back into the 1970s and 80s, airlines would board flights maybe 20 minutes before departure. But uh, we didn't have this jostling for uh, space in the overhead bins. 
Hardevelt says carry-on is the heart of the problem. Airlines need to give passengers a reason to check their luggage. Peace of mind, like real-time tracking for bags or compensation if you have to wait too long at the carousel. Most importantly, he says airlines need to start charging for carry-on and allow passengers to check their bags for free. People would appreciate this. They would feel less nickel and dimed. And the people who want the convenience and control would pay to bring their bags on the plane. So I believe that the airline would generate probably the same amount of money or possibly even more. Because less time on the ground means more time in the air. If a flight can shave even a few minutes off boarding, the airline may be able to squeeze in one more flight a day. Uh, and when you apply it by the scale of most midsize and large size airlines, such as WestJet and Air Canada, then that adds up to big revenue. That's good for airlines, but also could be good for us. It also means more flights for us as travelers, more choice, and potentially more low fare seats available. But if airlines change nothing, Hardevelt says boarding delays will carry on and carry on luggage will continue to be a battle. It's like a Hunger Games uh, environment on the plane and may the odds ever be in your favor of finding a spot for your bag near your seat. For The Cost of Living, I'm Danielle Nerman. This is The Cost of Living. I'm Paul Haverschrud. In Canada, about 4 million people work in the trades. That's around one out of every five workers. More than 700,000 of them are expected to retire by the end of the decade. As for younger people coming up to take their place, well, there's just not that many of them. So who's going to build all the houses this country needs and then fix all the plumbing, electrical, and roofs of those houses? Mandy Renahan is the head of the construction company Freshco and the host of Trading Up with Mandy Renahan on HGTV Canada. She believes more people should pick the trades as a career. Hi, Mandy. Hey, Paul. How you doing, buddy? I'm well, thanks. So, Mandy, we've been talking about a lack of skilled trade workers for a long time. Governments have launched awareness campaigns. Trade schools have upped their recruiting. Do you see this situation as, as getting better or worse? Oh, it's there. There's no doubt about it. I mean, Paul, I've been ringing the bell for for 20 years. I, it, you know, as idiotic as it sounds, Paul, the reality is is that you know peer pressure is real. When we push academia on, you know, all of the kids in school to go to university because that's how you're going to be respected, what we're facing right now is, you know, the outcome. Yeah, and now you you run a construction company. So what do you see when you're trying to hire people? It's, it's hard. I can't hire anybody. I can't find anybody. Nobody has any experience. And not only can you not find people because everybody's busy, Canada's growing. Our infrastructure's growing. So all the big companies out there, the top five that are doing a lot of the infrastructure projects and a lot of the big maintenance on what we have, you know, they get a lot of the, the skilled people. And so the small companies or the mid-cap companies, kind of like us, you know, we're kind of down at the bottom scrounging to find talent, you know, to, you know, to give to, you know, I'm in the retail world and, and never mind the consumer. I mean, Paul, it's a bad time to be a consumer if you want anything done that, uh, that involves a tradesperson. So if I think about how this might be fixed, isn't it just like money and pay more and people will come? That's the free market, right? Like that's how it works. Like Mandy, if someone comes to work for you, what's the money like? The money was always good, Paul, but now it's extra good. It's extra good. So right now, uh, a plumber coming out, you know, out of an apprenticeship after four years, a carpenter, a bricklayer, somebody in welding. I mean, they could they could start out between anywhere between forty five and sixty bucks an hour. And if you're doing that, if you're paying forty five to sixty an hour, which is like nice money, and you're saying that's to start, as that goes up. How much of that flows through to, to sort of your customer, the people you charge? Like, what does that mean for their bill? So 
the consumer is still going to be the one that pays. Inflation or not, we're going to see it's going to be a lot more for you to build your house. It's going to be a lot more for you to get a renovation. It's going to be a lot more than it used to be 70 or 80 bucks, Paul, for somebody to come to your house as a service call just to look at your dishwasher. Now you're going to pay double that. You know, this, since the pandemic, the, you know, the cost of a plumber, the cost of a carpenter, the cost of a, of, of a handy person, you know, anybody glazing, you name it, Paul. The reality is, is it's gone up almost 40% in three years because there's not enough of them. And the other thing to understand, Paul, too, is that we've got, a, you know, a lot of our trade schools right now are full, which is a plus. It's a real bonus. Like, it's it, there's a big smile on my face right now on radio. But it's really important for us to realize that those same people that are in school, they've got years out, out in, the, in the field before they have the ability to know what they're doing and them actually being an asset to an employer. Well, you know, you got into the trades as we've been talking about. How did that happen for you? Oh, <laughs> you know, Paul, I left home, as everybody knows, with a dirty hockey bag full of everything I had, a little bit of personality, just a little, a lot of ambition. And, you know, I, 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 university was not a thing, Paul, for me. I knew academically it wasn't what I wanted and I didn't have the money. So I did part-time jobs and I called people, you know, in the in the Halifax area, in the Truro area, and I, I used to say, listen, can I work for you for free to gain experience? Well, you know, Paul, they used to hang the phone up on me because they thought I was crazy. <laughs> so, well, yeah, of course. <laughs> of course, right? Even back then. And I would call back and I would say, my name's Mandy Renahan. I'm from Yarmouth. And I promise you're going to like me. And I, I will be an asset to your company, I promise. And I wanted you, so what, you went and like rent out some fancy houses in the south end of Halifax or what did you do? Yeah, did, did a little bit of that. But, you know, I've pulled a lot of wire. I've, killed, I, I've carried a lot of toilets. I've, you know, run piping, been on roofs. I just, I basically taught myself, Paul, a little about every trade in two or three years until I, I, I saw a big void. And the vo- the void in the in the in his industry being female was the management part of it, and so you know people were coming to me. It was kind of like I said, my my name spread on the East Coast, Paul, like a bad fart. You know, it was like this girl from Yarmouth, and and I the next thing you know, I was doing a half a million dollars in business by the time I was twenty. Huh. Well, then where do you see women fitting into the trades, and and also sort of the labor crunch that we're talking about? Oh. You know, women make up more than half the population, Paul. And so here you have this 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 great pool of skill. I mean, whenever I'm on site with with the program, I'm a the brand ambassador for Jill of All Trades, Jode, which is an awesome program of young ladies from you know grades nine to twelve that show up at a trade school for the day and they they're they're taught how to, you know, pull wire, carpentry, insulation, bricks. And a lot of the guys that are that that are the teachers at these schools will pull me aside and say, Mandy, and I'm like, why are we whispering? And they're like, bring me more women. They're great, you know, because, you know, women bring a different skill set. You know, they're very fastidious. They're very loyal. They do things once, you know, and, and they're extremely detailed, Paul. Well, yeah, I think the last number I saw was, was StatsCan says only about 5% of skilled trade workers are women. Now, you know, if you start, if you think about, well, we've got this, uh, we've got this, this labor crunch, we have a shortage of workers and only 5% are women, but oh, hey, 50% of the population is women. It feels like the math is kind of, kind of, kind of straightforward there. Yeah, 100%. I also think that we also got to realize that there's a lot of internal women too, that I don't think that these stats ever pick up that are in project management, site management, Paul, like all these other different types of trades. Um, but I also would say that, you know, the other thing that doesn't hit that stat is there's probably about two to 3% of women, Paul, that don't make it because of, of, because of the, you know, the, the headwinds and I've seen it my whole career. And so when you have the, you know, these, these women who have had the courage to go into the trades, they're, they're maybe one of two in a classroom of 20 and they love what they're doing. They're they're ready to go. They get out on a job site, and you've just got that arsehole that just does not get it. 
And, and, it, and it, you know, we've, myself and a lot of the advocates of women that are in the industry have spent some, some good time, you know, really mentoring and, and talking these women down from quitting because they're just like, I didn't sign up for this. I didn't, I didn't sign up to be catcalled, you know, when I have as many skills as he does or more. So that's something that's really starting to change, Paul. But like everything, we started too late. And so now we're not going to fix everything overnight. All right. And finally, Mandy, and I appreciate the time here, is then if you're making a pitch to someone to go into the trades, what's your pitch? My pitch is who the hell wants to be a millionaire? And it works every time, Paul, because I look at them and I say, if I can do it with what the, the adversity that I was challenged with, uh, 30 years ago, today with all the avenues, all the support, all the mentorship, Paul, they can too. Because I can tell you what, every consumer that opens up the door and sees a woman standing there with her iPad or her clipboard ready to give them a quote, you'll see. It, it's, it's catching on and it's gonna, and it's going to keep going. Well, Mandy, I've said it. If I said it once, I said it 100 times, I should have been a millwright. 100%, 100%. But you do have a great voice for radio, Paul, I got to tell you. Well, I appreciate it. Mandy Renahan, thanks so much. Thank you, Paul. I really appreciate the time. Mandy Renahan is the CEO of Freshco, a construction company, not the grocery store. That's all for this week. The Cost of Living is based in Calgary. The show is produced by Daniel Nerman, Ellis Cho, and Jennifer Keene, with help from Caroline Ferris. Our executive producer is Tracy Johnson. I'm Paul Habershrude. Thanks for listening.